Um, I think uh, so I'm going to be talking on the topic of exorcism and the occult, um, and I'll hand it over to Father John. Please give him a warm welcome. Perhaps before we start, let us please stand and we will say a prayer, a very fitting prayer given the nature of my talk. We will pray to St. Michael the Archangel in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in the day of battle. We are safe God against the wickedness and sinners of the devil. May God be you can be humbly pray. And we are O Prince of the Heavenly Host. By the power of God, cast the house Satan and all other evil spirits who wander throughout the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. And there's particular blessings as you start off the talk. This is known as a minor exorcism. None of you are possessed, but I'd like to give this type of blessing again before the nature of this talk. May our Lord Jesus Christ be with you to defend you, within you to keep you, before you to lead you, behind you to guard you, above you to bless you, who with the Father and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. And may the peace and blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit Amen. descend upon you all, remain with you forever. <coughs> Amen. So please be seated. When the priest, before retiring to the evening, says the office of Compline, one of the so-called hours of the divine office or the breviary in the old rite, he says the following. He's reminded of this constantly. Be sober and watch, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, goes about seeking whom he may devour, whom you must resist strong in the faith. That comes from the first epistle of St. Peter. And leave it to Peter. He comes up with the problem, but he gives a solution as well. So here he says, the adversary, the devil, goes about like a roaring lion, seeking who he may devour. But he gives us the remedy to that horrible problem. Be sober and vigilant. And be you strong in the faith, therefore you can resist. That's a very fitting start, because now we talk about the idea of the devil, who he is, and what he is all about. We can remind ourselves of a particular title that is given to him, the Prince of Darkness, and likewise the Prince of Lies. So when the devil speaks, darkness comes forth because of deceit, lying. Whatever he says coming out of his lips would be a complete and utter lie. Even when it comes to the idea of temptation, which is a false good, so to speak, as the theologians define it. So the devil, we call Satan, Lucifer, the so-called bearer of light, we call him for what he is, feels about, an old Canaanite term meaning the accuser. He wants to accuse us. He will try to bring us down by false accusations. He will accuse us and try to weaken us, to weaken our will. He will try to tempt us. We read a temptation on the part of our Lord himself in the desert. It's a beautiful gospel for the start of Lent. The devil comes to him. The devil knew somewhat who he was, but not, did not have a full knowledge of the Christ or the Messiah in the desert. So he would tempt him. Turn these stones into bread. And our Lord saying, no, man does not live by bread alone, but by the, every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The idea of the turning of these stones into bread would be the idea of self-indulgence. That's one of the primary tools that the devil will try to use, and again, a false good by way of temptation. 
So that would be called the concupiscence of the flesh. Then we have another temptation that is addressed to our Lord in the desert. Go up to the top of the pinnacle of the temple and throw yourself off and the angels will guide you down. And again, our Lord will say, be gone, Satan. That is a temptation of pride. He wanted this person in the desert who was fasting and mortification of all sorts. He wanted this particular individual to fall by the sin of pride. To rely on his own strength thinking, just by way of presumption, I will jump off the pinnacle of this temple and I will not be harmed. And again, be God Satan. Then we have another one. We are quote unquote, again we read in St. Matthew's Gospel, that third temptation that our Lord is taken up to a, a large hill and shown, quote unquote, all the glories of the world. All these things will I give you if bowing down you worship me. And again, the concupiscence of the eyes, what we would call materialism. These are the tools then, the primary tools that the Prince of Lies will use. We divide that into a number of categories, of course, morally speaking. But again, the concupiscence of the flesh, the concupiscence of the eyes, all these things I will give you, bowing down you worship me, in what is called the pride of life. So our Lord, even himself, was tempted. Even in the midst of all the penances and prayers that he was doing in the fasting. Now if the Son of God can be tempted, what can we expect of ourselves? In this book by Peter Kreeft, Angels and Demons, I read to you a particular passage. How did the angels fall and become demons? The answer, angels were created with free will and tested in heaven, as we were on earth in the Garden of Eden. Some chose to love and serve God, others chose to rebel. Scripture would describe this as a war in heaven, taken from the book of the Apocalypse or the book of Revelation. Demons were then expelled from heaven forever. Now, earth is the only place we know of where there is spiritual warfare, war between good and evil. Heaven has no evil, hell has no good. And mere matter, the rest of the created universe, as far as we know, has neither moral good nor moral evil. So only here on earth is there war, both, in external both on external battlefields on the internal battlefields of human hearts, which is the obvious source of all external wars. All this began when the demons first rebelled. So when did this angelic fall happen? Most theologians would put it at the time when the incarnation was announced. The word incarnate, when God the Father made known in heaven that he was going to send God the Son into the world to be born of a virgin. So this was presented to the angels. The good angels accepted this as a great mystery to bring about the redemption of a fallen human race. The angels have a higher state of intelligence than you and I do. And therefore they knew God's plan in heaven. And you had the bad angels, led again by Lucifer, the bearer of light, the highest of the angels. And in spite of the height of his dignity, great was his fall, calling out, non serviam, I will not serve. And thus begins that battle again, because then the bad angels, the demons refused to accept Christ the incarnate word, because they said to defend themselves, we're angels. He is God and man. We refuse to adore man because we are made higher than man. And hence the rebellion that first took place in the heights of heaven with St. Michael the Archangel being commissioned by God in his beautiful meaning of his name, who is like unto God. And hence the battle and the standard of battle in the person of St. Michael the Archangel who would cast aside and cast into the depths of hell, first created for the angels. And hence, what a thought, a rather humbling thought. And ever since then, 
the angels in the depths of hell have been given the power allowed by God to try, to, to try us, to tempt us, the world, the flesh, and the devil. So this is where we begin. So I'll start off with the word occult. It comes from the Latin occultus, and it means to cover over or to hide, to conceal. The demons love shadows. They love that. A shadow deflects the light and brings forth darkness. Therefore, their works of darkness reflect their very environment. Works of darkness. Occult practices would involve any system using knowledge of secret or supernatural powers or agencies. Now, opposite the word of cult, which means hidden, is revelation. God revealing himself to mankind. And again, that first started with what? And the word is made flesh and dwelt amongst us. The demons could not tolerate not just the fact that the Son of God was going to be both man and God, but how he came into this world. They could not tolerate who? The Blessed Virgin Mary. Why? Because her humility will lay waste to the pride of the demons. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it done unto me according to thy word. Do you realize how powerful that prayer of the Hail Mary is? And indeed, it reminds us constantly, the demons cannot tolerate that name. They certainly cannot tolerate the holy name of Jesus Christ. They cannot tolerate the name of the Blessed Virgin Mary, even more so, because she was a mere human being. And now the devils are out to attack who? Human beings. They can't touch her. Her humility wages war against the pride of those demons. I will not serve. And then the Blessed Virgin Mary is saying, I will serve. Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it done unto me according to thy word. And therefore the mysterious, beautiful birth of Christ himself, born of a virgin, born of a mother, and keeping a perpetual virginity intact. Again, the demons cannot tolerate the role of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Now, in the Gospel of St. Matthew, our Lord starts off his Sermon on the Mount with the Beatitudes. In these words, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but they put it on a stand and it gives light. He goes on to say, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So, what are we? Children of the light. What are the demons? The occupiers of darkness. The shadows. The occult. To remain hidden. And you and I to be revealed as, as indeed the light of Almighty God himself. But because of our good works. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel. So Jesus Christ will start off his public ministry telling us that we are the light of the world. And baptism, our simple but beautiful baptismal candle, reminds us that indeed, even as we're baptized as an infant, you are the light of the world. Or those who have converted to the Catholic faith later on in life. Again, the candle your own private, individual Paschal candle, again tells you, you are the light of the world. Archipe Lucem Christi, receive the light of Christ. The Paschal candle on Holy Candle, on, on Holy Saturday night, illuminates the darkness in the church. Lumen Christi, or the light of Christ, is sung three times as we enter and disperse the darkness. Why three times? and honor of the Holy Trinity, Lumen Christi, the light of Christ, the Son of God coming to us by way again of the Holy Trinity. This liturgical symbolism expresses the reality that the Son of God comes as the light of the world. Everything of God is done not in secrecy, but in the open. Everything done by the works of the demons will be done in secrecy, the occult, 
to remain hidden, to cover, to hide, to conceal. So within the first few verses, we read in the book of Genesis, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. And the earth was void and empty. And darkness was upon the face of the earth. And God said, let there be light. And light was made. Now, let's talk about the devil. First of all, let's not give him the attention he doesn't deserve. This topic can indeed be discussed and studied. But nonetheless, that devil has no right to constantly consume our thoughts, to consume our hearts. That would indicate a type of fear or intimidation. And as followers of Christ, we have no fear. I know that many times over, especially in different dioceses, when people give lectures, they're supposed to acknowledge now the first inhabitants of the land in which we dwell. I did that. I quoted Genesis. God created heaven and earth, the first occupiers of this land. We understand that. Now we know that in the works of darkness, the occult, in this sense, using it as a noun, we can broadly define the occult as agencies or means the demons will use to exercise their deeds. So the word occult, by way of a noun, person, place, or thing, is the means the demons will use to exercise their deeds. We know that God created the angels as extremely intelligent beings with knowledge far superior to ours. He predestined the angels to paradise, to eternal beatitude. However, a great number of the angels rebelled against God. Before being admitted to heaven, the angels were subjected to a trial of obedience and humility. And as again the fallen angels fell by pride and disobedience. Just as the Blessed Virgin Mary is exalted by humility and obedience. So Lucifer, the bearer of light, the highest of the angels, rebelled against the idea of being subjected to someone. I will not serve. And hence, they fell. The original sin of the angels are the same as those who implicitly or explicitly adhere to Satanism. Angels and men who follow Satan base their existence on three principles and practical rules of life. So what would be, so to speak, the mantra of the demons, of power we might call the commandments of the demons? One, you can do what you want. There is no subjection to the laws of God. Two, you obey nobody. Three, you are the God of yourself. And perhaps these three elements were somewhat presented to us a few nights ago with the horrible blasphemy against the Last Supper. As we read, as we saw, a horrible blasphemy against the Most Holy Eucharist. And indeed, those principles trying to defend themselves in what was called their presentation, you can do what you want without subjection to God's laws. You obey nobody. You are the God of yourself. And that horrible imagery certainly described these three elements. A one great good came out of that. We're enraged. We have a just anger, a just indignation, and therefore, likewise, a greater appreciation for the real presence. There are those who want the real absence, that's up to them with their free will. You and I, we want, because of our free will, the real presence. And so that war now that we're waging, and it blew up in their faces, let France spend $1.5 billion in a four-hour shipwreck, because indeed that's what it was. And so it's blowing up in their face, and they try to explain themselves. Even the one who is in charge of that particular presentation says, Oh, I have no need to apologize. We did nothing wrong. We were reflecting the values of France. What an insult to France. That is known as the eldest daughter of the church. So these three principles shined forth in that building all the travesty against God and against his most holy sacrament. So what happened 
between the angels is recorded in the 12th chapter of the Apocalypse, or again called Revelation. A great war between the angels who remain faithful to God and those who rebelled against him. The battle between angels and demons, Michael the archangel, the head of the good angels, and then quote unquote, the dragon guided the angels who rebelled and defeated. So here was no longer any place for them in heaven, and they, were, they created hell for themselves, the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation. So when the light of grace is lost, there is only darkness. When the candle is blown out, there's only darkness. The Bible describes their suffering condition as infernal, implying that the demons were forever excluded from paradise, from the beatific vision. And it's a teaching of our faith that the demons are definitively condemned. No turning back, no possibility of salvation. Because their arrogant choice is unchangeable. Their intelligence and will are far greater than our intelligence and will. Therefore, they could only make one decision, and they had to make it right then and there. The angels enjoyed a full vision of God, and they made their choice in a state of complete awareness. And that choice could not be withdrawn. So the bad angels willingly chose, even though they saw a vision of goodness, truth, beauty, what we call the meta metaphysical virtues, so to speak, or how God made us to embrace what is true, what is good, and what is beautiful. And the exact opposite that the demons rejoice in deception, <laughs> ugliness, all these different things, and instead of goodness, evil. That's their mantra. Now, let us consider the darkest thing of all creation. Nothing more horrible and unsettling than the mind of Satan. How does he work? How does he think? Well, can the devil read our thoughts? Is he able to understand our thoughts at a certain moment in our life? The answer is no. Only God is omniscient, meaning all-knowing. He alone will grasp the secrets of created reality. And that created reality are human beings and the angels. Although a spiritual creature, the demons do not understand what is in our mind and heart. However, they are good detectives. They can surmise it through observing our behavior. The demons know forensics, so to speak, forensic behavior due to their superior intelligence. It's not difficult for them to observe our every move. So, for example, if I were in the habit of swearing, the demons can conclude that in the future I will also blaspheme. If someone habitually reads bad and pure books, the demons will induce that individual to go further, not further up, further down. Let's turn the books into something visual and call it pornography. A Greek word that means pictures of evil. Nobody knows that. There you have it. So the devil will discern how and when he can tempt us. This is how he operates. That's why St. Peter exclaims, Brothers and sisters, be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a Roman lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him firm in your faith, our mantra. Does the devil fear us? Would he actually be afraid of us? St. James says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee you. So Satan keeps his distance from the one who nurtures his faith, who frequents the sacraments, and who wishes to live a holy life. The devil knows that he is stronger and smarter than us, but he also knows that we are not alone in our struggle. And the tools that we have are of heavenly tools, something that demons cannot intimidate or do away with. So the devil prefers to attack people who are far from God. Why? They're easy targets. Targets. St. John Bosco freed a girl from, possess from possession simply by entering the chapel clothed in his vestments, ready to offer mass. As an aside, 
Many exorcists attest to the fact that many deliverances have occurred at various Marian shrines, especially Fatima and Lourdes. The devil's greatest aversion, again, is the Blessed Virgin Mary. When the Angelus bells ring out, the demons flee. They don't want to hear that. And hence, not just the power of the Angelus, but even the power of our church bells, which are a sacramental. Bells aren't blessed in our church steeples. They are baptized. And that baptism, in, in likewise, includes an exorcism prayer. So when those baptized bells ring out, like in our cathedrals, the demons cannot tolerate it, especially when 6 a.m., 12 noon, and 6 p.m., the Angelus bells will deafen their evil. So now, after reading the devil's mind, so to speak, let's go back to the occult. Occultism. Occultism is a set of doctrines founded on religious, metaphysical, and physical concepts of the universe that presupposes the existence of an array of dynamic forces, personal and impersonal, physical or psychic, that are not accessible with the instruments of logic or of the mathematical and experimental sciences. From this point of view, they remain occult, hidden, but with which a few of the learned are able to establish relationships through cognitive instruments or technical practices. Now what on earth did I just say? So in other words, the great umbrella under which all the practices and forms of satanic adoration are gathered in order to be used by those who wish to profit from its gain. So again, the idea of the tools that the devil will use, the works of darkness. The most significant forms of occultism are magic, astrology, fortune telling, spiritism. It's based on the belief in spiritual forces that cannot be experienced through our external senses. The external senses of touch, touch, sight, hearing, speech, smelling. Thus again, they are hidden. By controlling these forces through techniques into which one is initiated, and after practicing appropriately, one can dominate the reality. These entries or being, these entities or beings are the unclean hidden spirits, and we call them devils, demons. So there you have occultism, the use of different tools that are used to exercise, again, the darkness of the demons. Among them, Satanism, obvious. The worship of Satan, one who explicitly decides to consecrate, consecrate himself, really desecrate himself, through a ritual, and then to enter into a sect that is devoted to the worship of Satan. These type of churches or communities are established quite a bit around the world, it's hard to say. And then they try to come out, and they have these public liturgies, so to speak. It happened in the United States recently, the so-called Black Mass, where they have 30 people inside this hall having a Black Mass, and outside, 15,000 people with the Catholic Mass being offered. I think we know who won. But there you have it, the idea of this Satanism, the Satanic practices. These people deliberately lead a life of sin, so here one can make a distinction. You have what's called personal Satanism, believe it or not, recognizing the personal nature of Satan and honoring him as a god. Now people don't go around with their driver's license on the back and says, hi, I'm a personal Satanist. But nonetheless, they recognize the personal nature of Satan and they honor him as a god. How do such people live, but even more so, how do such people die? How can they actually embrace darkness as they close their eyes one final time? Secondly, you have what is called a rationalist Satanism. Not believing in Satan's personal nature, but seeing him as quote unquote a cosmic energy that is present in each person and in the world. There is very perverse ritualism in rationalist Satanism horrible ritualism that takes place, even uh, what is called the idea of those who are abused 
through satanic rituals. So remember the objective of Satanist. You can do all that you want, full liberty, no limits. No one has the right to command you. You are released from all authority. You are the God of yourself, denying all the truth that comes directly from God. Death, judgment, heaven, hell, Ten Commandments, Our Lady, the sacraments, the teachings of the church. No, don't worry about that. That's all subjective. Do away with that. Again, the mantra of the demons. So now, what about the powers of Satanism? These powers are actually called gifts. The casting of spells, the evil eye, <coughs> charms, foresight, in other words, able to see things that will occur in the future, clairvoyance, possibly seeing things and people in other places not visible, so-called poltergeist activity, a sudden and unexplained movement of objects, now the so-called evil eye involves casting a spell through the power of a glance with the objective of quote unquote sending over the devil. We have a barrier to all that type of thing, our faith, in the practice of our faith. We would never tremble, quote unquote, never be afraid of the dark, the darkness of the works of Satan. Our faith overrides that. These things do exist. But stronger does our faith exist. Stronger do the sacraments exist. Stronger does the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ exist. And it is closing out of the month of July, dedicated to the precious blood of our Lord. And in that beautiful litany of the precious blood, the price of our redemption. And no demon on earth or under the earth can offer a higher price than the precious blood of Jesus Christ. They are bankrupt. Black magic. The Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches all practices of magic or sorcery by, where, by which one attempts to tame occult powers so as to place them at one's service and have a supernatural power over others even for the sake of restoring their health are gravely contrary to the virtue of religion. So black magic, to do away with that. I'm going to go see somebody that can heal me. I'll go see a healing doctor, so-called witch doctor. But don't worry, he's a nice witch doctor. Oh, okay. No such thing. No. Okay. Before this talk, I anointed two beautiful souls, quite ill, and they realized the healing power of Christ through the sacraments. The beautiful imagery of the idea of the formula from the from the right of the administration, what we call extra unction or the anointing of the sick. With this holy oil and the mercy of God, may he forgive me what of his sins committed by the use of the sense of sight, by the use of the sense of hearing, so on and so forth. Our five senses anointed with oil, holy oil, which is the symbol of the charity of Christ. These black magicians have no, have no idea, cannot even light their candle when it comes to the light of Christ. Now, magic does encourage superstition. From the Latin superstitio, when something is superimposed on another and distorting the original sense. So superstition, again, to do away with that. Magic is a practice used to do evil things and to influence people in the reality created by the devil. Magic entails evil spells, the evil eye, rituals, invocations, cursed food and drink, the so-called crystal ball. This involves not supernatural powers, but what is called preternatural powers. Demonic, not supernatural power. Now, evil spirits, the most common example of magic, someone is harmed through the occult or the hidden action of the devil in its various rites. The example again, the evil eye, curses, voodoo, satanic rituals. The objectives are to divide and destroy um, by, way, by making way of another type of practice. So to cast a spell. Now, some things are necessary in order to cast a spell. One, a witch or a wizard is required. Two, a person who commissions this witch or wizard. Then three, 
an object on which the ritual is performed. So those three things would be necessary. Now a person in a state of grace is less vulnerable to the attack of an evil spell. So we as followers of Christ and his gospel must never develop a magical mentality. Harry Potter, no. Okay, the idea of no, mag no magical mentality, the idea of our faith, the idea of hope, the idea of charity, the so-called three, three theological virtues. Now, spiritism, to evoke the dead through a medium. One might envision a seance, several people seated around a table, holding hands, invoking a deceased person through a medium who falls into a trance. Maybe to do away with some of the, I'll tell you a joke, okay. So this woman wanted to know where her husband went after he died. So she consults a crystal ball. His name was Henry. And Margaret says to Henry, Henry, this is Margaret. Oh, Margaret, how are you? Oh, not bad, Henry. Um, can you tell me, how are you? Are you happy? Oh, Margaret, I'm very happy where I am. Henry, are you more happy than you were with me these 60 years of marriage? <laughs> oh, yes, Margaret, I'm much more happy here than I was with you those 60 years. Henry, tell me more, what is heaven like? Margaret, he says I'm in heaven. <laughs> oh, thank you for laughing. Okay. <laughs> now, the most common spiritism, if you can say that, to evoke the dead to a medium, is the so-called Ouija board. Ouija. Two words. One from the French, one from the German. And it means yes. By the use of that Ouija board, we meaning yes, okay, and ya meaning yes, Ouija, so O-U-I-J-A, the French and the German words together, we're saying yes to something preternatural. And in my own experiences as an exorcist, and as a priest ministering in some of these type of environments, the Ouija board played a major portal or entrance to be avoided. Even commercially, these are sold, even there are pink Ouija boards to attract these five and six year old girls to use Ouija boards. Practices that take place in many schools, the idea of Charlie Charlie using two pencils together and working it out as a Ouija board that has caused a great deal of issues concerning possession. So the Ouija board, an undue curiosity with something beyond our own powers. So these means easily predispose people to great danger and attacks. Actresses commonly encounter issues of possession from those who use mediums or have consecrated themselves again to the Prince of Darkness. Do away with that. I know I'm speaking to the converted, but many people think, oh, the Ouija board is just a toy. Yes, it is a toy for the devil. It's not a toy in any other means, and I hence to do away with that. The idea how it feeds superstition and inculcates in us a fear that is not a godly fear, and a fear that the demons want us to have. The saints in heaven are there not because they were cowards, because soldiers of Christ, by virtue of the sacrament of confirmation, they knew how to overcome what? Their fallen lower nature. They knew what? By the power of prayer and penances, the demons could not penetrate their lives, try as they may. Now, you have what is called, believe it or not, as part of the means, <coughs> satanic rock. Music, music given over to Satan. Lyrics, which are actual hymns to the Prince of Darkness. At concerts with such images digitally displayed, they become subliminal messages. And these subliminal messages have been proven to provoke suicide, violence, sexual perversion, and vandalism. This takes place many times over a different conscience. The idea of people dying of drug overdoses in the middle of a concert or the rave mentality of nightclubs that provide them with an unhealthy beat of this music that keeps them active, active in the wrong way. And again, promoting the use of drugs or, or drugging somebody's drink, the so-called date rape type of stuff that is used. 
These type of things that are provoked by this unnatural beat of what we can call, it is called, satanic rock. Satanic rock is a conditioning that overwhelms the external senses, the sight and the hearing, and arriving directly at the subconscious. It erodes over time, it's inhibiting breaks. Our conscience tells us that we have to be inhibited, that we have to be controlled, self-controlled. Of course, we know that. But with constant exposure to something like this, it erodes our subconscious. So the obsessive repetition of these messages literally changes the way one thinks of and understands life, capable of poisoning the soul and ruining lives. You have obviously, aside from spiritism, satanic rock, the idea of evil spirits, you have diabolical possession. So this should be the worst encounter for any, any exorcist to have to see. The devil taking possession of someone, his body, remember not his soul, unless the person expressly consents to it. Possession then is the taking over of the body, not the soul, that belongs to God, that's his real estate. But in a true and actual possession, the person goes into a trance, he loses consciousness, leaving space for the evil spirit to speak. The devil agitates the person, can cause him to curse, can cause him in the worst type of possession, and this is proven, to vomit nails, shards of glass, or other objects, often showing great strength, and thus difficult to keep the person contained for the exorcist to do what is necessary. So anyone can, can become possessed, saints and sinners alike, believers and non-believers. Now obviously one has to be careful about the Hollywood version of exorcism. One might remember that movie from the 70s called The Exorcist. No, Hollywood took over that. But perhaps one of the more uh, approachable movies would be The Exorcism of Emily Rose, which is a very Catholic approach to the issue of diabolical possession. But I'm not saying go out, get some popcorn, and on a Saturday night, let's watch The Exorcism of Emily Rose. Okay, come on children, this is gonna be a good movie. <laughs> don't do that, don't try that at home. And again, we don't wanna give the devil his due. We do not wanna give him the attention he does not deserve. But again, these are principles to put out there again, to remind us again, he goes about like a roaring lion Certain human may devour. So we continue. Diabolical vexation, which is true and actual aggressions, physical or psychological, that the demon works against the person. They are caused by an individual's cultivation of imprudent habits, going to wizards or seances, Ouija boards, habitual mortal sin, or submitting to spells. You know, there's one thing worse than possession. You know, the devil possesses the body. Mortal sin possesses the soul. It takes the life of grace out of the soul. When people have approached me with the idea of requesting the aid of an exorcist, the first thing I ask them is, when was your last confession? I always ask them that, because I want to make sure that that person will be in the state of grace. So the worst possession, if you will, is the state of mortal sin upon the soul. And then when that person in a state of mortal sin does something horrible, we see communion. We read of this in the, in the 11th chapter of St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, of not partaking of the body and the blood of the Lord unworthily. But when we do that, again, it's a sacrilege, it's a profanation. We don't hear this enough from our pulpits about the importance of the life of grace upon the soul. So when a person in complete mortal sin or habitual mortal sin does this, it makes them become complacent and indifferent. Pope St. Pius X, he reigned as Pope from 1903 to 1914, and he once said that it still applies over 100 years later, we have lost the sense of sin. So when we lose the sense of sin, we easily can work in the devil's playground. Again, not necessarily possession, 
But when we lose the sense of sin, we lose the idea of humility and a humble mistrust of self. We lose the idea of what the saints would do every night, examining their conscience. And if they've done something seriously wrong, they might have a sleepless night till the next day. I need to go to confession. The demons cannot tolerate when a human being, when a human being says this before a crucifix, before the priest, Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. And when that happens, the demons have to wring their hands and say, I've lost. I can't do anything now. So the idea of the making of a good confession, what are the sacraments but the medicines of the soul? Those seven sacraments that deal with us all through life from the time of his screaming child and baptism until our last breath on our deathbed and in between. The idea of making for ourselves that first confession and immediately after that, our first Holy Communion. I am the bread of life, says Jesus. And unless you partake of this bread, you will not have life in you. Give me that bread. And hence our first communion, which must never be our last communion. The frequenting of the sacrament of penance throughout our lives. And again, when the demons see our habits, they cannot tolerate that. They cannot penetrate our strong will in the sense of sin. Do we fear God? No, we love God. Fear his judgment, but do not fear God himself. Should we fear the attack to the devil? Be gone, Satan. We imitate our Lord in the desert. Be gone, Satan. What is a deliverance prayer but a command? Leave me alone. That prayer of St. Michael the Archangel, that is a deliverance prayer for us. It is not a prayer, it is a command. Be gone. We have healing prayers to help us, of course, to help us with any predominant falls, or to help us when we are physically ill, or even mentally ill, we say healing prayers. Of course, we need that. But the idea of a deliverance prayer is a command. A prayer is directed towards God. A deliverance is directed towards the evil one attacking us. So through deliverance, we're not praying to the devil, we're praying against him, but we make a command, be gone, Satan. And hence the role of the Catholic priesthood in that regard, if specific, specifically those who are called upon in the ministry of exorcism, be gone, Satan. So, diabolical obsession. Disturbances are very strong hallucinations that the demons imposes that the demon imposes on the mind of the victim. The object of these hallucinations can be manifested as visions or voices. They can also appear as horrifying animals, as quote unquote as monsters and devils. A reflection of hell, so to speak, with diabolical obsession by way of hallucinations. Diabolical infestation. So these are devilish disturbances that act on houses, objects, or animals. The so-called haunted house, so to speak. Sound of footsteps, the banging of doors and windows, vibrations. In the, well, over the last few years, when I've been asked to give house blessings, it's been even by those who are of the Hindu faith, because they experience something unusual in their home, so they will call their own particular minister, if you will. And what do they say? We can't do that. Contact the Catholic Church. That's the answer. So they have. And I've been to many a home of Hindus, and they, I come in, you see that particular shrine and what they have. Father, what do you think it could be? Uh-huh. <laughs> um, I have to give you a Catholic answer here. <laughs> And right in front of them, I make holy water. I make it in, bless it in Latin first, and after it's translated for them, I want them to see how we use that sacramental holy water. And in that holy water, in the exorcism blessing, it says wherever this water is dispersed, <coughs> the powers of darkness be dispersed as well. So, it's powerful sacramental holy water. And I give them that. And I bless their home in the Catholic ritual. And I say, here, here's a catechism. <laughs> I say that to them. And after my book, hey, here's my book. It's not on the New York Times bestsellers list, but it will get there eventually. <laughs> so when they have nowhere else to go, let them call the Catholic Church. Beautiful. Even those, they have to admit, we don't have the answers, but they do. 
go to them. They would even recognize it not as trickery or superstition. Thus they see it as a power given by God himself. It's a beautiful way of evangelizing. So, <coughs> let's see. Now, Sante Marcio Arcangeli, Arcangeli, defend us in Prelio. Saint Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Again, we started out this meeting with a beautiful, powerful prayer. It originates from the wisdom of Pope Leo the Thirteenth. He was the oldest pope, born in 1810, and died in 1903. He was the third longest reigning pope. 1878 to 1903, 25 years, trailing behind Pope Pius IX and Pope St. John Paul II. Now, Pope Leo labored for the rights of the working class, the right to own property and exercise free enterprise. He was also known as the Pope of the Rosary. He wrote 11 papal encyclicals on the Rosary. He approved two new Marian scapulars and was the first pope to preach and to teach Mary being the mediatrix of all graces. Undoubtedly, Pope Leo XIII was truly a child of Mary. So on October 13, 1884, not too long before the message of Fatima on the 13th of the month, October 13, 1884, Pope Leo had just finished Mass. He collapsed and had a look of fright on his face. He saw a vision of the devil before the throne of God with the devil saying, give me 100 years and I will destroy the church. Jesus said, you cannot destroy the church, but I give you those 100 years. This 100 years is known as, quote unquote, the century of Satan, 1884 to 1984. Within a half hour of this vision, Pope Leo composed a prayer to Saint Michael the Archangel. And hence, those words that will stay with us until the end of time defend us in battle. We have what is called the so-called Leonine prayers, which is customarily said in the old liturgy or the traditional Latin Mass. At the end of the Mass, the beautiful Leonine prayers, and of course, our daily habit, God willing, of praying to St. Michael the Archangel. Now, we read a similar account of God giving leeway to the devil in the book of Job. God allows Satan to test this, his faithful servant, Job, who loses his family, his property, and his health. The book of Job was believed to have been written about between 500 and 700 years before the birth of Christ. Yet its passages are ever so contemporary, ever so contemporary, especially these words. Life on earth is a warfare. So as soon as we are baptized, we have a weapon, the life of grace upon the soul. And our life of grace grows strength to strength when we reach the use of reason, the age of reason. That's why Holy Mother will church, the Holy Mother of the church will say, now you're seven years old, you know the difference between good and evil, make your first confession. Then strengthen your soul with the bread of life, make your first holy communion and then keep on with those confessions and communions. Now, so life on earth is a warfare. So if life on earth involves a warfare, that means there is an enemy to defeat. Okay, I'm Sicilian, I don't have any enemies. They're all dead, okay? There are no witnesses in the process of their departure, and they all got the last rites. That's why Sicilians don't like Jehovah's Witnesses, because they're witnesses. But aside from that, <laughs> okay. So who is our enemy? The devil himself, Satan, the prince of darkness, the prince of lies. If angels are beings that exist, spiritual entities, then they have intellect and wills. If they have wills, they can choose between good and evil, like you and I. If they can make such a choice, then they are capable of choosing evil. If they choose evil, they become evil. They become demons, the fallen angels. In the Fourth Lateran Council, convoked by Pope Innocent III in the year 1213, convened two years later in 1215, called the Great Council, he gave us a dogmatic definition and teaching saying, 
Satan and the other devils are, by nature, spirits, created by God, and so originally good, but fall into sin of their own free will, and that they are eternally damned. We must never have the belief that hell is a temporary resting place. We must always believe it is the place of eternal condemnation. It is a place that you and I know by our strong faith that we understand by way of teaching and God willing, not by way of experience, that's for sure. It is a teaching that reminds us of a mistrust of self, but again, not a fear of God, but a love of God. And if we love him so much, hell will never be our portion. Because as we advance in the ways of perfection and sanctity, as we strive to become saints, as we strive to become holy, the demons will lessen their attack, or they may increase their attack. We won't notice it. It will be like a slight wind going past us. It will be nothing to recognize. Such will be our hearts in a unitive way in the love of God. So we hope and pray. So we're called upon to defend ourselves in the battle. How? Know thy enemy. We size him up. We have a knowledge of what demons can do. But again, if we think of them obsessively, they can cause fear. They can distort God's revelation or, we, or try to deceive us with false revelations. They can tempt us through our imagination or feeling. On occasion, they can move things of their own accord. Demons can possess us if we invite them in. We would never invite them in. The devils are our enemies. They can tempt us, they can try to oppress us, and try to possess us. But the angels fall, once they became demons, we're not as strong as the good angels. And hence the intercession of our own guardian angel. One given to us by God himself to direct us. Now, we go on with the idea, the angels can cause curses. Curses that can be invoked by others, or curses that simply come to us due to our own fault. A spiritual writer came up with four primary categories of sin that he believes will ordinarily call down a curse upon us. One, the worship of false gods. Even St. Paul says this, that the worship of false gods is the worship of the demons. Two, disrespect for authority, namely our parents. The fourth commandment tells us, honor thy mother and thy father, so that grace may be added upon your head, and you may live many long years upon the land. It is the only commandment of the Ten Commandments that comes with a beautiful promise. And hence, when we show our parents the love and the obedience and the respect that they deserve, the demons flee. The demons first attack, and the last battle on earth will be the demons attacking the Christian home. We know that is taking place. So when we show disrespect for parents, then the demons can make that home their playground. Three, oppressing people, especially the weak. The Catechism enumerates four particular sins that cry to heaven for vengeance. Of them, these concern, socially speaking, the payment of fraudulent wages, the idea of premeditated murder, and again, the oppression of the poor. The fourth particular sin crying to heaven for vengeance is also listed here in terms of an unintended, unintended curse that comes, quote unquote, by illicit or unnatural sexual relations. Illicit or unnatural sexual relations. The fourth sin crying to heaven for vengeance the vengeance simply calls it sodomy. And in that particular practice, the devil is literally in the details. So these are the four particular, so to speak, avenues that the devils can use by way of a curse, a self-imposed curse, so to speak. It does remind us of the love of virtue and the hatred of vice, particularly any particular lifestyles that seem to be exonerated in the present day and age in which we live. The idea for us, LGBT, love and God be triumphant. That is indeed our mantra. 
and he is triumphant, and we share in that victory, especially in terms of Our Lady of Fatima, who said that her Immaculate Heart will triumph. And to close off with a beautiful meditation taken from, taken from the, not the imitation of Christ, but the imitation of Mary by Tom, Thomas Akempis. We read the following. Dear brothers and sisters, be faithful servants of Jesus Christ and loving devotees of his most holy mother, the Virgin Mary, if you desire to be forever happy with them in heaven. You will be dear to God and his blessed mother if you are humble of heart and chaste of body, if you are moderate in speech, prudent, conscientious, and self-controlled, and do not become for anyone an occasion of scandal or legitimate complaint. It is gratefully, greatly helpful for your salvation, for the honor of God, and for the praise of the Blessed Virgin, that you be devoted to prayer, committed to study and work, meek when rebuked, temperate in eating, chaste in the use of your eyes and body, and straightforward in all your behavior. Therefore, if you desire worthily to praise and properly to venerate the Blessed Virgin, act as children of God with simplicity, without malice or spite, without lying, becoming angry, quarreling, complaining, or being suspicious. Rather, for the sake of Jesus and Mary, endure every adversity with fraternal charity, humility, and patience and imitation of the lives of the saints. Do this for the sake of your own peace and for the edification of others. But above all, do that you may enjoy one day the glory of the Holy Trinity. Amen to that. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much.